we are, um, we are, this is our fourth, I think, a gathering of a preaching practicum class. Um, most of you have been sent books. Let me just check. Do you all have the books now? Did you, did they get to you? I see some nodding. They should, you have not all had the books. This is one of them. And oh yeah, good, I see it. Because I was actually hoping to read uh, a portion from this and have you read along because I wanted you to become familiar with it. And it's, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we, we do. I could have sent it to you as a text, but I, I was hoping you had your books. Um, <clears throat> so if you do have those books, particularly I was gonna read uh, just a, a, an essay, it's in both, uh, but through pr from preaching through Romans. Um, so I wanted to have you see that. We have, we have, what have we learned? Well, we, the first week, we talked about the role of the preacher. We, we, we started with, do you believe the Bible? And uh, we saw the whole subject of, of defending the Bible. And I said that I thought there was underlying issues as to why people attacked the Bible uh, as, as deeply as they do. Uh, I don't think it's, it's always an honest conversation that's being had. I think people are fighting against a moral God who ha it threatens to hold us accountable. And that's just, that, that is for thousands of years been, been offensive <laughs> to the human race and it is now. Uh, but I said the real issue was, do you believe it? That you and I have to make that deep decision uh, to believe the word of God for ourselves and to preach the Bible as the word of God. And I gave you Billy Graham's example, which is just a classic, uh, how God used him after he'd settled that issue. And so each of us have to settle that issue of what is the Bible to us and how will we preach it. We saw the, <clears throat> I've, I've talked to you about your assignment. Uh, Pastor Mary and I was on a call today and she she quoted it again. Remember, I told you about the grumpy old reformed preaching uh, pa uh, professor I had at Fuller, James Dane, uh, I, and I'm, I'm deeply appreciative to him, so I can call him grumpy old. But I remember him holding his Bible out at us and scowling, which he really did. And he said, uh, God has already said to his church everything he wants to say. Your job is to let him say it again. That crystallized for me something that just made sense. All of a sudden, oh, is that my job? I get it. And that just, it just, it just put everything in focus. I don't have to come up with the material. I don't have to be clever. I don't have to be, you know, anything like that. I have to, and I just need to let this speak again. And then, of course, that takes some cleverness or, or at least the revelation and all of that, but I knew my assignment. And so I put in front of you, yeah, I've said it right from the beginning, I'm trying to turn you into people who are reformed, not Calvinistic, we all had that discussion, but reformed in your approach to the word of God. That you see your pulpit, not as a soapbox, not as an entertainment, not as a stage, but you see it as a holy desk a sacred desk from which the word of God is being spoken. So I was, uh, I was hoping to instill that picture, that value to you. The second lesson we talked about transformation precedes education. Remember, I took you to Matthew chapter 28. We looked at the Great Commission. And I showed you that Jesus taught that people became disciples by being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We said that that was not a baptismal formula. It's not what you said. It was not just a theology of the Trinity. He was talking about three specific works of God. Baptism of the Father is repentance. We had a fabulous discussion last time, I think, on that, on that very subject again. But we got into what is repentance and why hasn't it been uh, taught? and Why has it disappeared uh, from so much of it? We looked at the words submission and all of that. But transformation precedes education. A person becomes a disciple through the miracle, miraculous work of God in the human heart. It's, not, it's, it's a very real thing. The lights go on. The eyes come open. The ears can hear. The person is a different person than they were 
a few minutes ago. And to be honest with you, the person at least that was in my upper right hand corner is, was my guinea pig that I preached on the other day. This is Brad. I didn't know they, they would come on, but they heard about this class. And uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to use you for illustrations, I, I'm, I'd be happy to have you <laughs> join us. So this is the man who walked down the aisle and said to me, Pastor Steve, I got saved today in your sermon. And I said, Brad, don't say that. And I, I started to laugh, thinking you're teasing me or something. And you didn't laugh at all. You looked right at me and you said, all I know is I prayed with you today. And whatever happened, I, he said, what, something happened to me today that's never happened before. And I looked at you and it had. I could see it in your eyes. And then a year and a half later, you moved to Oklahoma. And there you are now. So there's, there's if, you, <laughs> if some of you want to want in, to interrogate my, my illustration, there he is right there. So welcome on, Brad. Um, transformation precedes education. We talked about you have to let, understand the gospel. We need to understand that we, we're preaching for decision and then we're training those who have been changed inside. Did you hear that? Get a hold of that. That's not a small matter. If you understand that, if they become saved and deeply changed inside, it, it, life is it's fun. It's hard work, but it's fun. Because you're teaching people that are inwardly motivated. They love their Lord and they want to follow him. It's a reverent work. I've had times of standing there after service and I want to take my shoes off as I listen to somebody sharing with me what's in their heart. I feel like I'm in, on holy ground. It's like, you want to do what? And they're coming out. They're motivated. They love him. They want to serve him. I mean, it's a whole different breed of cat that you're dealing with if you understand that lesson too. And then last week, we talked about why preach through a book of the Bible. What, what, what is the point? And we said the real point of it is, who raises the topics? Who decides what we're going to talk about? Do you decide what you're going to talk about and go looking for texts to preach it? Or do you let God raise the topics that he has decided are important for the human heart? And we said that he, yes, culture changes dramatically. I mean, but honestly, people don't change. If you took off, if I took away your glasses and your cell phone, you could be the same person 3,000 years ago. That's you. I mean, so yes, there's been technological changes, but the human heart hasn't changed. The needs of people, the temptations of people, the way people are made, and all of those things, those go, it's, it's as old as time. And so when the Bible speaks to those things, it's speaking to things that are as, as present in the human heart now as they were 1,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago. Those things haven't changed. I said, and I, and I think it's so, so important to hear, you don't make the Bible relevant. You'll, You'll hear somebody come along going, we've got to learn to make the Bible relevant. No, the Bible makes you relevant. When you let it raise its topics, you suddenly become extremely effective. You go right after the core of human issues. Willingly or unwilling. It's, it's, it. So who decides what we're going to talk about? And I will just say on a practical side of things, as you begin to teach through a, a book of the Bible, you're going to find it is so much easier for you, the preacher. You know more or less what you're look, looking at for next week, what it is, you're, where, what passages you have, a, you develop as time goes on, a background, you know the author, you know the book, you know, the, you know so much about it. So you begin to live in the book. And, and, it, and it, so it's for you, it becomes, a, a, it's almost like watching one of these soap operas where every week there's a new, a new episode. And, and so you're picking up on a new episode and here's the next episode of the Gospel of John or whatever you're preaching. And it really does flow like that and, and it becomes fun and people, instead of being bored, people are really sad when it's over. 
is they get into that journey and, and, and uh, they, they, they miss it. You, you'll, you'll find that's true. Today, we're going to get more practical. I'm going to talk to you about types of sermons briefly. I mean, I'll just, I'm just going to rehearse this. I'm not going to go into a lot of technical discussions. I'm just, I've just put it in my own words uh, for, what I, for the ways I see it. I can, I'll give you some titles or terms for it. But, uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about forming a sermon. Next, next class, which is next Saturday morning at 8, we'll talk about delivering the sermon. When you're go how do you just some just some good coaching about how to how to speak publicly, how to deliver your sermon, that kind of thing. We'll we'll cover that. But today we're going to talk about types of sermon. And so if you're you have your notes, we we will start with types of sermons at the bottom of page three. Lord, we ask I ask for grace. Help me, Lord. Say it in a way. We, we can hear it, and we can ultimately hear you. You're our teacher. I am not. You are. You are the master. We are your disciples. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. There are, <clears throat> when I talk about preaching through a book of the Bible, people make assumptions. And, and what they assume is, oh, well, you're talking about that kind of preaching, aren't you? And there, it's the, the one they're thinking of particularly is the first one you have on that list. The technical term for it is, is textual preaching. You preach textual sermons. And a, a textual sermon is this. The sermon gets its topic and its points, its main points, from a few verses. I am planning on taking you to one of those, and we're going to do a little drill uh, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, but not right now. But it's where the, where the, the got this, the, main, the, the topic. So this is where the topic comes from. I'm studying along, and I find that within, really, a textual sermon is usually considered two to, no more than two or three verses. Maybe one. Well, let me give you, you, know, you all know this one. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And so you start with the love of God. God so loved, he did what he gave. And then he, and you go, you go right down and you come up with your points. You remember that, those signs of sermons? You've heard them. And they're quite, they're quite good. Uh, there was one pastor in, in uh, Dallas, Texas, at First Baptist Dallas years ago. Um, he spent... He did a true textual preaching through the Bible. I don't remember how far he got, but he certainly didn't get through the whole Bible. And he would just take it the next step. He grew that church for 20,000 people. And they said he would, he would, he would preach, and he, when he was done, he'd be soaking wet. And they'd have to put an overcoat over him or he'd chill. But he just, he'd just get up and he'd deliver the word. Just the he'd just take the next thing, and he'd do a, a true textual sermon. Uh, going through it, and as I said, built built that church to be one of the largest churches in the in the United States. Doing that kind of preaching, I can't do it. I I'll just tell you why I don't do it. I can do some some verses come up to me and are textual. I can see the sermons, but others I just can't. So I'm just showing you what you use is all these types. I hope it's like having a number of tools in your toolbox. When it's time to hit the nail, you grab a hammer. When it's time to turn the screw, you turn a screwdriver. When, it, when, you, when you're tightening a bolt, you grab a wrench. So you'll use the style of sermon that it fits the next section. You see what I'm saying? All right. The next kind of sermon that's here, the technical term is expository. It's a sermon gets its topic and points from an extended passage. So you will read maybe five verses, 10 verses, and that, what you're looking for is that unit of thought, where does it start and where does it stop, where, what, one, this one subject, and then what's that topic, and then you look internally to it and you find points. Here's your main point on that one, here's your next point, and here's your next point. And so you're taking your points out of that passage. Expository. Um, 
G. Campbell Morgan was an expository preacher. Uh, the, the, many of the great ones that are, have been expository preaching. But again, I don't, I, I will do some expository if, I, if it's there, but if I don't see it, what I largely do is this third one that you have on your list. The sermon gets its topic from the next unit of thought, so whatever that is, like an expository sermon, and then the preacher identifies the points that need to be explained, uh, will need it to be explained, and, and, and apply that, and then applies that topic. So somebody, somebody said, well, Pastor Steve, what you really do is expositopical. And I, I guess that's kind of it. So I'm not, I, I, I've, had, I've had people, I had one fellow who was, <laughs> I was in his preaching class I, at, a, at a convention and he started talking about this and, and I, think, I think he was frustrated with me and he, he made a comment, he said, some people think that by teaching through a book, they're preaching, uh, but they're textually, but they're really teaching topically. And he, then he <laughs> couldn't help himself. He looked right over at me and then looked back and he was gunning for me, and, and it's true. I, te I exposit the topic, and then I ask myself, what do we have to know about this thing to understand it? And those become my points. So that's the way you'll, you'll, you'll but I'm gonna teach you to do uh, a, a classic outline. Uh, if, when, a little later, I'll show you that. I've already laid it out in your notes and things like that, I'll, but I'll, sh I'll show you that. What you need to know is you need to find what works for you. And I would suggest what works varies from passage to passage. Sometimes a, there's a textual sermon just staring you in the face, it's like, yeah. Other times you might do expository, but you, if you follow through, you can always find the topic because God's word always has a purpose to it. And that's what I work with is the topics. The next one I have there, and this is just kind of covering the basis. The preacher picks a topic and looks for passages that talk about it. I would call these concordance talks. You know, somebody says, I'm going to talk about love. And then they open up Strong's concordance and they look under love. And then they, they find some verses that talk about love and they go right on, they go down them. And, and just, just work on that. Or I want to talk about faith today. And they open up and they look for faith. And they find some verses that talk about faith and then they preach on that. They just kind of come up with points. But they've started, you'll notice, with a topic they want to preach on, which isn't wrong. I've done this too. I mean, it's not, it's, there's times to do it. There's times I need to talk about love with this church. We've got to hear one. So it's not wrong. But it's, it's simply one way of, of doing it. And I, think it, I don't think it's the way to do it all the time. And then you have those where the preacher preaches along through a passage of scripture, turning every verse or statement into a short, a separate short sermon. That was the way, that's basically the way Calvary Chapel has, has, has developed the model because they learned from Chuck Smith. Now you need to know, I loved Chuck Smith. Mary and I drove down to his church for four years, uh, 60 miles each way, back when it was in a tent in a bean field. And uh, he, he was originally, of course, a four square pastor. In fact, his, he, his, uh, his mother worked for Dr. Van Cleve. She was his secretary. And uh, his sister-in-law was Sister Baker, who started the first Phoenix four square. So he, 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 knew, he knew Arizona long before any of us did. I mean, he was, he was part of the foundations. But he, he, would, he was able to take and preach through a passage and just turn those each thing into an insight and just preach right on down. He, he actually came to the An Angelus Temple and he preached the, funer the, the memorial service for Dr. Van Cleve. Dr. Van Cleve was a dear friend of his. I mean, he, he grew up under him. He kind of mentored him. He used to travel with him in the car when Dr. Van Cleve was the supervisor and would go out on calls and Chuck would go with him. And so he loved him dearly. I watched Chuck Smith pre preach 1 Corinthians 
uh, 15 on the resurrection. And he quoted it by memory, not missing, not making a mistake anywhere, and bring one point out after another as he just went down this approach. It was, I leaned over to my wife and I said, I'm in the presence of a master. This guy, it's just, he's in another league altogether. I don't know how he does it. I, fundamentally, I think he had an enormous level of intelligence uh, just to be able to hold those ideas the way he did. And the, so it, does it work? Sure it did for Chuck. And you know, hundreds, I think, of Calvary Chapel pastors will often preach this way. So these aren't wrong ways of doing it. I just want you to see the, the array of options of how you, of, of preaching. Now, what I, here's what I'm going to suggest to you. And I, I remember saying this to my preaching class at the Bible College. You know, you're, you can preach any way you want, and you should preach as the way Lord, the Lord leads you. But in my class, I'm, <laughs> I want you to preach my way. And I want, I want you to do what I, I want to know. And here's really my point. I want to know that you can do what I'm suggesting. Not that you have to do it, but if you can't do what I'm trying to teach you, that'll hinder you. So I want you to have the skills to preach this way, and then you preach any way the Lord leads you, because you really, you really need to do that. Okay, so now we're at forming a sermon in your notes. The most important thing I want to put right at the top is when you write a sermon, Stick to only one topic. And believe me, I know how hard that is. And I have failed my own advice many times. And it never did work. <laughs> when I didn't do what I'm telling you, it didn't work for me either. <laughs> but I'm just saying, this is really hard to do, but one topic. And, and if you think of the confusing sermons you've heard, the kind that you walk out and then you're, somebody says, well, what did, you what did she talk about? You go, um, I, I don't know. Uh, let me think. And you cannot remember. It's because there, there was more than one sermon there. Haven't we all heard those sermons? I've, I've heard them go all the way from the resurrection to, to, to the book of Revelations and the Antichrist, all in one sermon. I mean, it's just the whole gamut. Stick to only one topic. Resist preaching two to three sermons at one time. This dilutes the effect of any one of them and makes it very difficult for your listeners to remember what you've talked about. What we have to work with is the way the human mind works. The human mind needs to have a, a, a logical path for the most part. It needs to start. It needs to think about something and develop that thought and come to a conclusion. That's the way the human mind works. So if you have a second sermon that needs preaching, do it next week. Don't do it this week. Let us develop and digest the truth you're bringing us this week. That lesson alone will make a huge difference. And it's way hard. It is so hard to do. <laughs> I did, next is identify the next logical unit of thought. So I'm, I'm reading through my Bible, and I've preached up through verse 5 of whatever we, I'm in. I'm going to look at verse 6, and I'm going to read on, and I'm going to try to see what is this passage. Where does it start, and where does it end? What is the logical unit of thought. So keep in mind, the Bible is written by intelligent people, two intelligent people. It is not a cryptic book of religious sayings. It is not, it is, it is not, it, it is, it is, it is, it is meant to be revelation. It is meant to be something God wants us to know. So what was, that, what was that person talking about? And to whom were they talking? And where does that unit of thought start and stop? Does that make sense to you all? You know what I'm saying? All right. 
It could be one verse. It could be 10 verses. I, I have to identify. So I don't preach textually or expositorily necessarily, unless of course, wow, in the next two verses, is it perfect textual sermon? Then I'll do it. But I'll usually look for that unit of thought and then I'm, then I'm asking myself, what, are we, what, is the, what is the topic here? Now I want to look at the process. So if you have your book, uh, I'm looking at preaching through Romans. And if you don't, I'm, I'm sorry, just bear with me. I want you to see that on page 277, there is a chapter that starts out and it says how to study verse by verse. It's in the front of the commentary on the other book, and it's at the end of this thing on preaching through. And this is, a, I want you to know it's there. It's a digest of what I'm gonna say now. And I, I thought I would read some of it because it's said carefully and I can get a lot compacted in uh, just a few minutes. So if you have it, turn with me to page 277. And I want to just read this to you quickly. The, the three study questions listed below are ones which ones I use when I preach through a book of the Bible. I didn't develop them. I think they're very old. But hopefully the explanations I provide will make them a practical tool for you to use as well, if you don't already. And by the time you've answered all three about a particular passage, you'll discover you've prepared the basic components of a good sermon. As you move through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, you'll notice that each, each author teaches on a certain topic and then moves on to another topic. Watch for these, there it is, logical limits of thought. Some can be quite long, contain numerous subpoints, but try to identify where each one begins and where it ends. The best sermons focus on one topic at a time rather than attempting to string together many different topics. Number one, what does it say? By the way, this is, a, in, a, in, a, in effect, this is OSL. You'll recognize soap. You take observation, application, or prayer, and I, because I like the old hear, do, and pray. But it's more or less the same kind of thing. What does it say? As I reflect on each verse or group of verses, I ask myself, what do I need to know in order to understand this verse? In other words, what questions does this verse raise that I will need to answer before I can understand what the author is saying? That's a very important insight. You're looking at a passage, doesn't make any sense to you. Ask yourself, what questions do I have to ask, have answered before I can know what this passage means? I guess I will share this. I had, it, it, when I was in um, seminary, I was, I had a professor, George Ladd, and I had him for, for exegesis, biblical exegesis. And I was to write an exegetical paper. Well, that just means this. And I wrote and wrote, and I just, this whole stuff, boy, I worked hard on that. And I handed it in, and I came back with this huge red C plus on it and scribbled across the top, he said, this isn't exegesis, exclamation point, underline. And I thought, you know, I'll bet it isn't. But I didn't have any idea what it was. And so I went to, I had a friend and he got an A. And I went to Ralph and I said, Ralph, look at this. I got a C plus and he says, this isn't exegesis. What's exegesis? And he says, well, Steve, he said, what questions do you have to ask and have answered to know what that meant? He said, just answer those questions. That's exegesis. And I said, I can do that. And that's why I'm passing it on to you. This is way simpler than we make it. That's why I keep, I opened up, I think I probably said early on, really what we're talking about is work ethic. Not, not, you don't have to say, well, I'm not smart enough. Sure you are. 
This is work, all we're talking is work ethic. You're just like, what, what do I gotta know? What do I gotta answer? And then we'll talk in a little bit about where do I find my answers? And that's part of the skill of teaching to know how to do that. So the first thing I do is what, what do I need to know in order to answer the questions what pass, that this passage raises? I can understand what, before I understand what the author is saying. That's what we're always gunning for. What did Paul, what did Luke, what did Jesus, what did he mean here? What was being said? This quickly identifies where I'll need to focus my study. Which words need to be defined carefully? Who is the author of this book? And to whom was he writing? And why? Does he mention people or places that I'll need to look up? So I can picture my, I can picture in my mind what I'm reading. Is there research I need to do on ancient customs? Modes of transportation, clothing, food, or family relationships? Are there other passages of scripture which might, which might help me understand this one? Answering so many questions might seem like a lot of work, but when I'm done, a fascinating story emerges that people will love to hear. What you're doing is filling in a picture. Somebody says you, you don't finally understand, for example, what a word means until you can see it in your mind. Every word, you know, people often, when they look up words, they go to like a, a dictionary or a Strong's or something, and they, and they come up with a whole bunch of synonyms. And they say, well, you know, this word means uh, this, 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 and this. And then they kind of pick the one they like and use that. That's not how you do it. You, look, you study it, and I'll teach you how at some point, until you can see that word and you know how that author meant to use that word. What did they mean by love? You, you know, don't you, that there's at least four, there's actually more words in the Greek that mean love. There's one for family love, called storge. There's, there's one for uh, erotic love, that's eros. There's brotherly love, that's phileo. Um, so th what, did, what did this person mean when they used the word agape? Oh, well, that's the kind of love Jesus showed us when he died on the cross. Boy, so I can't just say love. I need to define it. I need to understand what kind of love are we talking here? Do you see what I'm saying? This is so true of the words. And you say, well, I don't know the biblical languages. And I must say, I think it's worth studying them. But the tools now are, are so available that you can do a good study. You, you know, just, as, just a, an exhaustive concordance based on Strong's, you can do a lot of good work just with that one book. I'm serious. You, you, can, you can answer a lot of profound questions. You do, this is not rocket science. It's just, hard, it's just work. But boy, does it paint a picture. All of a sudden, when you begin to fill in those meanings or, or you get out your atlas, I, I, have, I have a whole row of atlases. I, and I pull them all out. And of course, now we got Google Earth. And I'm telling you, that is so interesting. For example, I, I, when you go into the Gospel of John chapter four and, and Jesus goes to the woman at the well, remember that? And he's there and he goes to a town called Sychar. Well, where's Sychar? It's in Samaria someplace. Well, if you look it up, you can find it's the old, uh, the Greek word they called it, Sebast, or, and, and, you can literally find where it is. I went on Google Earth and you can bore down on this thing until you can literally count the olive trees in the orchard. And you can, you can look and follow the footpath between the capital city of Samaria, where Jesus, where Philip, by the way, later preached, the footpath winding its way through the olive groves and over the, the, the fields, to, to the village of Sychar. 
You can tell you exactly how far it was. You can see the whole thing. When I did the book of Acts, I would get out Google Earth and I followed Paul right through his voyages and his journeys. I mean, you, you, can, you can look at, as you watch him go, th go through Galatia, you can look at it, you can see it. And then if you get the right kind, you can pop it up and even look at the, look at the scenery. And so you begin to fill this in and you can tell the story when he's going through the mountains there uh, out of Phrygia, you, you, you can describe it. And, and if you don't think it isn't fun listening as, as you're sitting there telling about how, how this happened and they walked this way and what it looked like and then and, and you show up, it, it, you often wonder what stories will I tell? What illustrations will I have? How will I make this? Just start telling the story. Be a good storyteller and let the Bible tell its own stories. You will have such, I promise you, you'll have such rich stories that, that it just becomes fascinating to listen to it and you'll love it too. So this is the first stage. What it, this is is doing our homework, basically. What does it say is just is doing our homework, answering those questions. I don't know what that word means. I don't know where that place is and who on earth are the, are the, are the Pharisees? You have to fill that in and, and let it become real to you. The second question, excuse me, I lost my own place, is, okay, excuse me, before I move on, here, this is an important little paragraph for you. I, I'll, just, I'll just read it, but please, please study this next paragraph. Before I move on to the next question, I want to emphasize the importance of defining words carefully. It is so easy to assume that we know the meaning of a word because we often use it in daily conversation. But that word does not mean, but, but that word does, that does not mean, pardon me, that we know what the author meant when he used that word. We need to remember that the purpose of this first step is to understand as deeply as possible what the author intended to say. What did the original recipients of this letter hear the author say when they read those words? Without doing this work, we can see meanings in a text that don't really exist. This has led to many unnecessary controversies. To avoid this pitfall, try to identify the Greek or Hebrew word. Whether you read Greek or Hebrew or not, as I say, there's plenty of tools. You can look it up in Strong's and get a Strong's number and chase that number down. And you don't have to read Greek. You don't have to read Hebrew. You can find out very well what that word means. Um, give special emphasis to those passages with which the same author uses that word in the same book. So if let's say we're looking at the word of knowledge, uh, word knowledge. And so I'm going to look and see where Paul used the word knowledge, if that's who wrote it, in that book, and then where he used it elsewhere. In fact, I'm often not satisfied. I know what the meaning is until I pretty much look up all the references and read them in context. And I'm constantly watching for that picture, that action, that object. What is the word really? What's the root concept of that word? And at some point, the light goes on. And I go, oh, I get it. And I can see the picture. And then I realize how it's being used in each of those contexts to mean what it means. Most words at their root are based on familiar actions, objects, or experience which humans encounter in life. As I watch to see how this word is used in passage after passage, the root meaning of the word becomes clearer. And then I return to the verse I'm studying with, and I know what the author is saying, it becomes more apparent. Next question. What does it mean? What does it say, we said? What does it mean? Once I understand what the author said, the next step is to recognize what he meant. In other words, the spiritual truth, what spiritual truth was he teaching to men and women who first read those words? Though many, <clears throat> many things have changed over the past 2,000 years, the basic issues of human, humans haven't changed at all. And of course, God never changes. So the eternal truths which are taught in the Bible are just as true today as they were for those who first heard them. As I prayerfully meditate on what the passage says, the Holy Spirit is wonderfully faithful to show me what it means. Time and again, I suddenly see something I never saw before, or at least never at that depth. 
And then I try to state that truth in one simple sentence. That's, this is where it really gets hard. So I'm looking at this passage and I'm seeing a truth here. And then I got to get it down. And uh, this is, no, I, 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 I want you to hear this. You got you to be able to write it in one sentence. One simple declarative sentence. And that is really hard. But you see what you're doing? You're clarifying. You're thinking it through. You're distilling your language. So by the time you get up and speak, you're right on target. You're not hemming and hawing and fishing around. You, you know what you're trying to say. And, and you will see how, how critical this is even in forming our, our, our outline. As I told you, you as, as early on, we're gonna schedule our week so there's time to do the kind of work I need to do. You, it's not just get something quick and throw it out there. I have to process this through, all right? Um, <clears throat> as I prayerfully meditate on what a passage says, the Holy Spirit is wonderfully faithful to show what it means, show me what it means. Time and again, I suddenly see something I never saw before, or at least never at that depth. And then I try to state that truth in one simple sentence. Remember my picture of the, I told you last time, I think I mentioned, you get those pictures on the wall with all the colors and shapes that mean nothing. And then if you kind of cross your eyes and sit back and look at it, all of a sudden you see some picture, there's, there's something in it. There's a, a lake and a pine tree and a trout jumping out or whatever it is. And that's the way it'll happen to you over and over again. You're looking at this passage going, not only do I not understand this, I don't even like this. This is crazy. What is this? And you say, Holy Spirit, help me, please. I do not see the life here. What is it? Sometimes in the middle of the night, you wake up and go, I got it. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've had to pad downstairs and write it down so I didn't forget it when I woke up in the morning. So I just want you to know God is on your side. It is a big deal to God that you know what that means. He is so committed to trying to help you understand and you'll get revelation. This is part of what keeps you going. Just the, that experience of having him show you the meaning of the word and making it real and all of a sudden you go, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I get it, how'd I miss that? You, you realize what a sacred, holy task you're involved in. The God of heaven is, a, is sitting there counseling you as you're doing your work. It's very, it, it, it changes the whole thing. You're not like, oh, I gotta do another sermon. It's, 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 it's a, you feel the beauty of it. You're getting fit. All right, I'll stop. I'm preaching now. Um, how, <clears throat> I won't, I wanna use only plain understandable language. No religious language is allowed. Just, just basically, you, it's, that's for you to understand, but you don't use it when you preach. I avoid theological terms. I ask myself, how would I explain this truth to someone who knows nothing about the Bible? Or how would I explain it to a child? This is usually much more difficult than it sounds. But it's in, this, in the struggle of choosing the right words, that the practical application of the truth becomes apparent. I know I finally stated it well when I can picture it in my mind. When that happens, it becomes easy to remember times when I've seen that truth at work in my own life or someone else's. Until then, I realize that I need to keep meditating on that truth. And I need to keep rewording the sentence until it really makes sense. And once I get it right, memories of watching God do that very thing begin to flood my mind. And my heart is often stirred by the beauty of what I'm seeing. And this leads me to the final step. Does that, what, that step make sense? We're processing it through till we see that life-changing truth. 
and, and I think I've said it somewhere, if, if it doesn't move your heart in a study, it will not work when you preach it. You can feel when, when the anointing's on it. It'll move your heart in a study. It'll, it'll just, you'll go, oh, man. And, and you'll, you'll feel the impact of it. And then when you get up and bring it, that impact's there on everybody, not just you. It's, it's there again. It's, it's remarkable. Okay, the third step that I want you to see, and I'm taking time with this. I know this isn't as much fun reading through this, but, but just bear with me. These are really important points for this whole process. You, I, so I, that's why I'm even showing you in the book so you can come back, read it again, evaluate it till it makes sense to you. And then always feel free to ask, Steve, I don't get that. Or how do I do that? I will be happy to help you. What does it mean to me? Now it's time to write out examples where I've seen this truth at work. In some cases, it may be easier to think of illustrations from the lives of other people, but it is important to ask the Lord to show me where this truth has been at work in me. Because that discovery brings a much deeper level of understanding. We're not being self-centered in this. That's not the point. See, you, we can all say, oh, I've seen it. You know, Mother Teresa or Billy Graham or, you know, or some, some great missionary that we know. There's an example. But it, they say, that, well, so where's he done that in you? Well, boy, when, when you begin to have to think, let's see, I don't know. But when it fi finally clicks, you go, oh, I, <laughs> no, I remember that. All sorts of understanding floods into you. That's it. This memory brings with it all sorts of practical insights because I remember not only what I did in that situation, but more importantly, what God did. I'm able to describe how he helped me overcome emo the emotions and obstacles which I encountered along the way. Such insights bring this truth alive to me and also to those I'm teaching. It awakens hope in them that they too can walk this truth. There's nothing wrong with using examples drawn from the lives of others. But if I don't take the time to reflect on what a truth has meant to me personally, a depth of understanding will be missing. Please don't skip this third step. I just gotta, I, this is, hear me, please. It's the one, this third step, this application step, is the one that makes our preaching and teaching of the word interesting to others. If this is missing, you know what they'll say? They'll say you're a teacher. What they mean is you're boring. It's, I mean, pardon me, I, and I've been called a teacher. But if they say you're a preacher, it means you don't have any content, but you have a lot of emotion. If they say you're a teacher, they mean, yeah, you got a lot of information there, but nothing really touches my heart. What, what, what you, I don't know what, they, what we want them to call us, but we want both. <laughs> we want both those sides. So it's this third step is the thing that makes the difference. You can provide all kinds of information, but boy, you got to get to this one. It's what makes our preaching and teaching the word interesting to others. Truth by itself is dry. Spiritual principles without practical application seem lifeless and boring. But the moment people begin to see how God's word will change their lives, they listen attentively. When you turn the corner and start talking this, you can hear a pin drop in the room. Everybody's leaning forward. They are, they are completely engaged. If you're explaining a deep principle, you've just taught them a principle, and now you're showing how it applies in life, and you have those deep personal insights to it, and you're, or you're, you can hear a pin drop in the room. We all do. We all love that. This, this is the step where faith and hope awaken. So please... Don't skip this step. And then I simply rehearse those steps for you. And I, I just mentioned it, but you always end with hope. When you talk a practical application, you always, always, always end with hope. The biggest killer in the church is that people lose hope. And they, just, they decide they can't change or there's, there's no hope for them or they've gone too far, or they've tried and failed. 
you always want to build up their hope and faith that, that indeed this can happen in their lives. And that's why you tell your own weaknesses. Uh, I'll comment on some of that later because there's certain things you don't want to talk about. But very often, the, if you can be transparent about your own struggles, your own weaknesses, it's very helpful for people. Um, how am I doing? I, I don't have my watch. How am I doing for time? Okay, I got five minutes and I got a roll here and then I'm going to leave it open for questions because I know I've got, you're getting slammed with information and you probably have some really good questions knowing you. So here we go. The Bible provides its own stories. Watch for opportunities to describe what was taking place. Tell the story in a way that allows us to picture in our minds as we listen. Use vivid language. Always use pictorial language. You know, somebody just walk across the stage. They, 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 they staggered across the stage or they ran across. It always something I can picture. As you study, watch for the truth that touches your heart. If it doesn't move you in the study, it won't move them in the sermon. State the truth in one simple declarative sentence. In other words, what are you going to talk about? And then list the questions that you must ask of the statement to understand it. Answer those questions and they become your main points. See, when you get into these, main, these questions, these become your main points. Always introduce your topic by showing us how it applies to our felt needs. I'm going to cover this. We're going to put these together. I'm, I'm just, these are just, I'm just shooting it at you for a minute. That's your introduction. Always sell it when you go in. Why should I listen to you? How about listening to you? Is it going to help me? What am I going to learn? What am I going to, how am I, how's it going to change my life if I listen to you today? And you have about three or four minutes <laughs> to convince them that it's worth listening, where they're off you know, in their own world. Tell them what you're gonna tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them. That's an old saw, but that's the introduction, the body of the sermon and the conclusion. Tell them what you're gonna tell them. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about learning to forgive some of those really painful betrayals that have happened in our life. I think all of us have those. There's nothing more painful than betrayal. And, and God has an answer. He has a way he can heal our heart. No kidding. He can heal that terrible wound. He did it in me. We're going to see it in an example here in the life of Joseph. And he can heal you. See, I got you already. I mean, you want to hear that sermon, don't you? I, I, I went right for the need in the heart and showed you how that sermon is going to talk to that. But this is this is a very that's your introduction. Where am I? <clears throat> always introduce your topic. Always apply the topic. Minister for decision. Always invite people to respond. Roy X Jr. I've mentioned him before says the sermon builds a platform for you to stand on and minister to the people. So your sermon lays the foundation and touches and opens the heart. The anointing comes, presence of God's working. Never just say, okay, everybody, let's stand and pray and let's go home. Don't waste it. And so you have to plan your sermon so there's time to minister. You can't, and I, I'm terribly guilty of this. Where I run too long, I'm out of time. That It's really a, You've got to somehow leave sufficient time to say, all right, we've heard today the word of God. And he said something here to us that's really important. I bet, I'll bet as you're listening, there's a whole bunch of you right now saying, I, I, I need that very thing. Well, let's receive it right now. Let's take out, let's open our hearts. Uh, the, Rich, Richard Castillo, our pastor here, did this this last week and he's ministering on the Holy Spirit. And he says, everybody, I want, I want you to open your arms. And I want you to just begin to receive right now. Just say, come Holy Spirit. And then as he's ministering, the Spirit's moving on him. And of course, he was moving on us too, watching it. It was really potent. And so he's, but he's invited us. I mean, we're, we're not just hearing this message on the Holy Spirit. We're now receiving the Holy Spirit. And he begins to move. You see what I'm saying? 
you got to put that platform, you build it, and then you minister. And you got to leave enough time to do that. Never skip this final step. This is where the sermon moves from information to heart change. Schedule sufficient time to, to prepare and study, and then write out your introduction and transitional sentence. If you've got your notes, I'm going to stop now, but I, I want you to just see. If you've got your notes, we'll turn to page eight. What you'll find in page eight is this. So can you see that? Yeah. It is. It's that. Are outline. you asking him to turn in the notes or to the book? Good question. <laughs> in the notes. I just want you to see we're going to have a whole outline in our notes. I've, I've left the book. Sorry, Marion. Thank you for. That's okay. I, when you said turn to page, I was like, no, oh gosh. No, I want to make sure they understand. And then look at page 11. Here's your outline, and then here's definitions of each of those categories you have in your outline. We're going to take uh, a text, and we're going we're gonna to practice. I want to practice you through it. And then I'm going to ha encourage you, and I haven't, I haven't assigned homework, but I would like you to be able to, to take something and, and give, give it a try. What I'm going to do now is stop and ask, let you ask questions. It's time for questions. It's 7.01. So I can do what I was going to do. I can do it just, I can do it next time. So you take your time and ask the questions. I, you had a, I hit you with a whole, with, with a load of information there. And I just sailed on by it. Ask what you need to ask. Did it make sense? All right. If you're not going to ask questions, then I'm going to take you to the test. I think we have a couple questions. Okay. They were being shy. <laughs> okay. I, who are you calling for? Carrie Castile. Okay. I just was wondering if you could just list again. Um, I wrote down some of the tools that you used. Um, and I was just wondering if you could just kind of let, rattle off some of those and I'll put them down. In this book, mm -hmm. right right after the section I just had you read on page 281. It has a thing on Pastor Steve's reference books. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you asked the question. And this, these are not the commentaries that I use. Those are internal in the, ref, in the, in the material. But these are the reference works that I have used. Steve, are these also the, the, in the reference list that you gave us last uh, two weeks ago? No, that's a different, different, different list. Those, that was on, these are the list of references you used in preaching through Romans. In studying, yes. In studying. These are the tools I used. Now, let me just say this, and I've, I've often said it, and, and I know you will all use computers, so bear with my language. But I've said that I could put in a cardboard box the books I need to study through, for example, Romans. It is, you do not need some massive theological library that'll actually just make it worse. What would I use? What do I use all the time? Well, I, I'll just tell you what I personally use all the time. I do use an interlinear. Do you know what that is? It's a, it's a, it's a text that has the Greek and then English below each Greek word. I did teach Greek for three years. I do know, I do read Greek. And so, but let me just say, I, when, even when I teach a, a class like, of students like you guys, up there in Washington, I had a thing called Preaching Practicum. And I would photocopy a page of that and I took them through doing what, just exactly the three steps we just did. And I took them through just before I moved down here, we finished going through Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, verse by verse. 
on any given week, we never went farther than two verses. Asking the questions, trying to understand what that meant, all of that, and then looking up the various things. Where would I look? So I open my, I've got my interlinear, so I'm using that, but I'm, all, but I'm always looking for what are the key words? That's the first thing I want to know. What are the key words? Strong's, and I wouldn't suggest Strong's, because that's all King James. Because what? But if you get an exhaustive concordance based on the translation you use, hmm. you use NIV, I use NASB, uh, but I have an NASB exhaustive concordance. But most of these Bibles, I'm sure ESV will have one, and they are built on the Strong's systems. James Strong came up with a brilliant system. And so he's got numbers after each word. You look up your word, your reference, and there's numbers showing where that word is used and all of its variations. And those numbers, you look in the back of the book, and it's a dictionary. Hebrew comes first. And then Greek comes after that. And they're all, so all I have to look up is number 4751. And if it's in the Hebrew, I'll look back there and 4751, and they will give me a transliterated into English explanation of the word and then a definition of it. Those are good definitions. Those, that's not rinky dick stuff. And it'll often tell me that this word is composed of a preposition on the front of it, and then there's this word. All that's right there, and it's very understandable. You can read it. So you can just use your exhaustive concordance to do a whole bunch. Another tool I use a lot is W.E. Vines, Dictionary of New Testament Words. W.E. Vine is it, 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 it's good stuff. And what you have to know is what the Greek word is, and you look in the back. And he's got, he's, got a, he's got them all listed from the New Testament, but they're transliterated. It's Greek, translated in English letters. And I look him up, and then in the text of it, it's the English from King James. So that could be a difficult thing, but, but nonetheless, it's good definitions. And uh, I use that. Um, I have, uh, well, I, I, I won't go through all. And then I use this... Um, another lexicon, um, and I use some, a few things. They're, they're in there, but not a lot. You'll find ones you like that are good. It just, the biggest key is don't just take people's definitions. Look up, look up that word in all the places it's used and see how, what it means in that context. Tell you, picture it in your mind. And, Carrie asked that question. Did I answer your question? I bet you. That was great. Thank you so much. All right. And, yeah. and if, you, if you get stuck on something, say, I tried to do that and I can't find that. Where did you go? Just ask okay. me. <laughs> sure. Marcia? Or no, I see Brad first. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mary and you make the call. You, you're, the, you're the hostess. Um, I was just wondering, you say just stick to one topic. Do you have a... Uh, kind of a guideline of how many sub parts you have to that one topic? I mean, do you go like A, B, C, and D or? You, 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 you want to, if you, if possible, you don't want to have a lot more than say three major points. Okay. Honestly, you will see in my own book of sermons, I don't always stick to that, but I, but you'd like to have three, four points, you don't want a bunch. Um, and when I did it, <laughs> some, of my, some of my staff would scold me and, and I don't blame them. Uh, so it's just as muddled when I do it as anybody else. <laughs> so okay. keep, keep it down to, uh, the, the verse I was, here, let's look at it. Go with me in your Bible. I'll, I'll show you an example. Go to 2 Timothy chapter one. And I won't go through all of the wonderful background. This is this story. Boy, this will tell a story. But look at verse 7. Now, let's just, if we were going to teach, the, preach this 
it, it, it would be a textual sermon. It says, for God did not, has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. That's what mine says. Yours may well say, God not given us a spirit of fear, of, of power and love and what, whatever. If we're going to look, look this verse up, what words do we need to understand? Uh, timidity. Yeah. Um, power, love, discipline. Yep. Spirit. Yes. Probably, probably the word given to start with. And even spirit of, you might want to. You, yeah. So you'd be looking those up. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to, the next step we'd want to take, we do, do we do our homework, but you'd want to know when did Paul write this in his life? Where was he when he wrote it? Um, mm -hmm. Who is Timothy to him? Why does Timothy need to hear this? You'd want to fill those background things in. All right, but then we'd look up those words. So how would we structure this thing? How, what, what would you say that, the, what's the topic that you would preach? You're going to take that one verse and you were going to turn it into a sermon. You're going to put in one sentence, one simple statement, what you're going to preach out of that. What, how, what would it look like? Trust God to give us all we need. Oh. Trust God to give us all we need. Trust God to give us all we need. That's good. Something else. Um, God doesn't favor the coward. Doesn't favor the coward? No. Well, and it's, you know, he certainly it doesn't, there, does he? Mm -mm. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and, a, and of discipline, which I, you'll hear me use the phrase sound, sound mind. It has something to do with that. Well, it's something like God has our back at all times. Yes, he does. What, 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 just, just brief it. Why do you think he had to say this to Timothy? Because Timothy had something to be afraid of. And he was trying to encourage him. Yeah. Timothy's, Timothy's worn down. I mean, when you get into it, he's a young man. You know, he's, he's half Greek, half Jewish. Mm -hmm. He's had all kinds of rough treatment. Um, and he, he really doesn't have a father. Paul's become his father. And he's traveling with Paul and Barnabas and all. And those two men mentored him and raised and really have him. But he still gets intimidated. And so Paul speaks to him, and Paul's about to die. And he knows it. And he's saying, Timothy, you've got to preach. Now, do, has any, have any of you been afraid to preach? <laughs> have, well, I sure have. And here comes the word that says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Sorry, the verse is right before there. He is saying, you need to fan into the flame the gifts that God has given you. He's trying to, how, he was built for this. Yeah. Timothy was built for this and he's afraid. You see how the story begins to emerge, even as we're talking here? So here he is writing his last letter to his son in the Lord. And he's saying, Timothy, you must not be afraid. You have to, and who's he afraid of? He's afraid of all the, the Christians. All of the, they've been, they're, they're harassing him. Poor fella is in, in Ephesus. And that is a rough town. And they're, they've been beaten up on him because he's young. Jews don't like him because he's half Greek. Greeks probably don't like him because he's half Jew. I, I don't know what, how that works, but, but, but he's, he's got all of this going for him. And, him and, God, and Paul says, don't be afraid. Why, now, why shouldn't he be afraid? Why should, why should you, and I hope we're all wearing this, why should you not be afraid to preach? 
Um, because God empowers us with his spirit. Yes. And, and what, what does he give you? But what is this Holy Spirit going to give you that makes it possible for you to preach boldly? Love. Yes. Power, a sound mind. Yep. Yeah. I mean. How about that? Three points? <laughs> <laughs> you see it? Yeah. So so our sermon is our sermon topic is holy boldness. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about God gives us the the boldness to speak his word. There's our there's our thing. And then, then we'd have, a, you don't know this yet, but we have a transitional sentence. We'll ask a question of it. How does God give us the boldness to preach the word of God? The answer is, he gives us the spirit of power. He gives us the spirit of love. He gives us the spirit of a sound, disciplined mind. Three points. We have to know what, what, power, what power we're talking about and how does that help me preach and be a minister. I have to know what love, what you, one of you mentioned love, what kind of love and how would that give me the boldness to preach? I gotta know what a sound disciplined mind is. What kind of, what discipline is he gonna give me that will give me the boldness to get up in front of a bunch of critical people or well, people don't even know the Lord and staring at me like I'm a, a fish in a, in a fishbowl. Um, what's going to give me the guts to get up and do that? Sound, disciplined mind. we got to do some work, don't we? That's a good sermon, but we don't even know what we're talking about yet. So we've got to research those. How does Paul, what does Paul mean by those things? What did, what was, and then you have to ask yourself, so where have I seen God step into my life? In a moment of fear, when I didn't have the courage to minister or reach out, I was feeling so insecure. I was feeling so out of my league. I didn't even belong in that place. And I, I, but I knew I, I had to do, step out and do this. Where have I seen God do something like that in my life? Now, once that clicks in you, you can so preach this passage, you don't even need to look at your notes. One of the things that I found in that class, the practicum class up there, where I'd take them through and we'd do this, and we, we'd do it together uh, right there in front of each other. I mean, everybody's got their computers open, and I'm, saying, I'm throwing out these questions, and they're having to look up to all the answers, and they're coming up. And so we, in this case, we'd come up with a definition. We'd define power. We would have defined love. We would have defined a disciplined mind. We would have understood what kind of timid, timidity are we talking about. We would, have, we would have asked ourselves the questions, why is Timothy afraid? Who's Timothy? Who's, what, what, what's the situation here? We fulfill that in. By the time we were done, everybody in that room could have walked out of that room and preached a fabulous sermon on it, almost effortlessly. This is not, it's hard work, but it is not that hard. And once you let this happen to you and you learn that, kind of the feel of it, the taste for it. I'm telling you, God is faithful and he will do this in you week after week, after week, after year, after year, after year till you're, you're old, like me. And he's, it's still there. I haven't run out yet. And you won't either. I'm just telling you, this really works. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm pushing it. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, did I raise any more questions? We've got yeah. just about 10 minutes. I saw Marcia, I saw you earlier. Two questions, which version of the Bible do you use and, and why? And the second one is what's the best one or two atlases that you would recommend? I noticed you have a bunch of them mentioned in the back of your book here. I do. Um, for, I, I, I personally, for many years, have used the New American Standard uh, because it is, has been the most literal. Now, my wife has gotten, and she got me one, 
uh, this ESV, uh, the English Standard, mm -hmm. it is also a very literal translation. And as I read it, some of it, it's, it's, it looks pretty nicely done. Mm -hmm. What you have is two, here's the spectrum and here's the arguments. These people say, well, you gotta read one of these, these versions that everybody can understand. Well, not, and, and so you have, you have the easy flowing language. But what happens when that happens is the, they have, the translators have done a great deal of interpreting where, where they're trying to do idea for idea, but that requires them to decide what the idea is. And I don't want them to do that. I want to do it for myself. And so I want the most literal I can have. Tell me what it says. Let me decide what it means. I don't want you to decide, you translator. I want to decide that, not you. So I want a literal one, which is word for word, and as opposed to idea for idea. But it, it's, it's, it's up to you what you like. If you've done your homework, any one of those versions will work because you know what it means. But if you just take one of these kind of easy reading ones and you take an impression from it without doing this work we've talked about, you're very likely to be wrong. I mean, you, I, I heard a devotional on the radio yesterday. You know, the guy stepped in and he took a passage and just, just mangled it. He had no idea what the thing was talking about. And he came up with a nice idea. It, would, it was a fine idea. It had nothing to do with the text, but it was a good idea. So if you do your homework, you can use any version you want. But you, the, 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 the teacher, the preacher, you need to know what the actual text says and, and do your homework. And then you can read anyone you want to the congregation. And you ask me, which atlas would I use? Well, one thing I would do is I'd learn to use Google Earth. That is fascinating. And then the, the atlases I have, I like... What do I list here? Um, I particularly like, I like Holman. Uh, the quick, I have a little quick source when I use the, the other one is pretty good. Um, the Atlas of Bible Lands is, uh, is a good one. Let me think about it. I, I mean, I use, I don't have it. All my books are put away right now. Um, and I've been in storage, and that is, that's a real handicap for me. Um, but the Holm, Holmans are, is, a, is a pretty good uh, Bible atlas. And if you have a good Bible, they should have some, like the new ESV does have some nice maps in the back. Mm -hmm. Like that ESV study Bible, it's got a lot of help. Like it's got diagrams of the temple in there that are, mm -hmm. that are very easy to follow. Okay, thank you. Kimberly Balsley had a question. Uh, so on the topic of making it your own and kind of telling your own stories, um, as someone who's preached a few times, you start to, I think, have to discipline yourself not to tell the same stories over and over again and link them to, you, you catch yourself, I think, using the same story to teach different things. <laughs> Um, how did you discipline yourself or how do you discipline yourself to continually come up with, um, I, I guess, mine things out of you so that it doesn't become like your shtick or, oh, I've heard this story 50 times. You know, I just caught myself telling the same stories over and over again. One thing, what, that you, this is a very good question, Kimberly, uh, because this, this whole thing is, of, 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 of stories are important and they need to be there. One, one thing is to just rehearse what I've just said. The more you can tell the story of the passage you're in, um, those are always fresh because you're moving along. Um, the other is keep, keep a record, like in your, your journal. When something the Lord does, it's notable, write it down. And maybe put a little symbol by it or, or note in the back page where those things are. Uh, where you have those stories. I, I know people who will carry actually a little pad of paper or you can put it in your phone, you know, and they'll, if something happens, they'll write it down. Um, where you see an illustration, it, those become fresh and, and God will start showing you stuff. 
you know, you're driving along, you see something, there's an illustration right there. So he'll begin to provide things for you like that. But it, that's not a small matter. There is a book like 7,700 Bible illustrations and that kind of thing. I, I've, I've just never felt led to do, use it much. I look at them and it's like, huh, uh, they aren't mine. And I, I just, I, so I haven't, drawn, I haven't used them. Pastor Steve, you do tell personal stories? I do. All right, let's, thank you for bringing that up, Marion. Um, I, I feel it's actually quite helpful to, to, to use those stories about yourself in which you are not the hero, um, where you actually talk about your own weaknesses. Now, I, want, I did say earlier, there's a limit to that. And I want to just caution you on something. Back, Roy Hicks Jr., again, um, Roy, he made a statement one time that I just never forgot. In fact, nobody who heard it forgot. <laughs> we all keep quoting it. And he said, you know, when Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, that you have him in the upper room there, and he, he holds out his hands and and he says, come and touch my scars, you know, and hold up his robe and lets them touch his side. And, and Roy said, would you notice that Jesus showed them his scars, not his wounds? In other words, he didn't hold out just bleeding, gaping holes and say, here, touch it. That is, he held out something that God had healed. So when we share stuff that God has healed, it has a powerful effect. When we stand up and just share our junk, it just usually brings everybody down. It's, it's kind of icky. And so there really is a balance. Think through what you're going to share. And then I, I'll just say this. Years ago, when I was in seminary, one of the professors just said this. He said, don't end up being the sex expert. And I know it's popular to teach a lot of sermons on sex now, but whatever. But I would just say, if I were you, I would not be up there talking about my sexual struggles if I were you. Um, there's places they have counseling, there's places to get care. Um, but I would not be discussing that. I can talk about sex in a general sense. I can teach principles about it. That's important. But be very delicate about sharing it. Because once you've shared some of this stuff, we can't ever look at you again without thinking about that. You, you mark yourself. You, you, it's sort of Here's another part. Sometimes people clown. You know, they, they, they act real goofy and wear funny, you know, red noses or crazy stuff. When you're the preacher, I don't really want to think of you wearing a red rubber nose. I don't want to think of you as sort of a fool. And, and no, you don't want to be, you don't want to be overly you know, all into yourself. But there's a certain dignity that the person who teaches the word of God to others needs to carry. I, I, I don't, it's because we can't get the image out of our minds of the last time you did all that dumb stuff. And so it, it, it kind of turns you into a clown. And you're not a clown. You are you're the Lord's servant and there's a dignity to you and there's a calling on your life that it does make you a bit different. You're not just like everybody. You're not better than everybody, but you're not like everybody. You're set apart. And so if I were you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about my sex life. If I talk about sex at all, it's going to be in a very careful way. I just want to caution you on that. Uh, somebody said, if you want to, if you want to really stir up trouble in a church, 
start preaching against sin, you know. <laughs> the more you preach on it, the more it almost stirs it up. If you want to clean up a church, preach on the righteousness of Christ, faith in Christ. And he said, and the person said, you can clean up any church that way. So don't think I've got to, I've got to kind of wade into the, the muck and start really talking about all this gross stuff. It, it, I, I just wouldn't do it. I'll just, that's just my counsel. Um, and I don't bring in my own things. And when I'm going to bring in and share illustrations of my own failures, which I do a lot, I hold out my scars, not my oozing wounds. Um, things that, where I can say, and here's what God did for me and how he healed me, so, rather than leaving everybody going, ooh, that's icky. I think we're out of time. Uh, Marion, what would you like us to do? Well, first of all, I want to find out, does anybody else have any more questions? So good. Is this so good, you guys? Are you just freaking out? I'm freaking out. I'm like, what are we hearing? I, you know, honestly, Pastor Steve, this is really, really life-changing. So good. Thank you. And I'm so um, happy to have all of you on this call. And we're so happy to, you know, I, we've got our Grace Northers here, but there's some of you that are not Grace North. We're so happy to be a part of resourcing you and helping you and uh, partnering with what God is doing in your life. And I can't think of any better uh, gift to give you than the gift of knowing how to preach. And um, so, so excited. Steve, anything else you want to say before we... Uh, next time we'll talk about delivering a sermon and, and just how that, how that, some of the practical matters of delivery. And then we'll talk about the personal life of the preacher. And then we're going to turn and talk about preaching Romans. And we'll get into, and I'm going to have you do it. I'm going to have you come up with a passage and do it. I'll have you even uh, learn to take one of my sermons just to practice it and distill the idea that uh, God gives you and then we'll put it into an outline. And I'll be asking some of you to have the courage to share your outline and, and let us even evaluate an outline. And uh, if we, as, the more we can do of that, the better. That'll be really helpful is, is uh, I, th I recall I told you early on that when I, we began to critique the outlines of, our, of, of the preaching students, they just did so well. I just wanna say that to you, you really can preach. You just need to know how to get it organized, how to get that put together. And then it, you being you, just tell them what God's given you is very powerful. You, you watch. So I'm done. Awesome. Well, I had the privilege of preaching one of your sermons on Sunday, and I had a blast with it. And um, I... Um, so grateful. We have started in our church, those of you that go to Grace North, you know this, where we've decided to do the 65 sermons that Pastor Steve gave us as an exercise of discipline and work ethic between all of us. Um, so this is, uh, and, and it's a bit of work because when you write your own sermon, it's, it's as much work to take somebody else's platform of a sermon and make it your own it takes a lot of work to do that. I found that out firsthand this Sunday. <laughs> so like, uh, but praise God, I made it through the sermon. Pastor Steve, I made it through it. So, um, but- was it, uh, was it a good sermon, everybody? <laughs> Amen. I see a lot of thumbs up, Marion. Well, they're, they're very kind. <laughs> so, well, and I'm gonna say something is that one of the most, I had a couple of guests watching you or listening to your sermon and they were greatly impacted by your use of personal story particularly so don't, don't ever underestimate that it was beautiful and actually that's why i asked you about the personal story i thought oh maybe i shouldn't be doing that but I, i'm a personal story aholic but i uh I, I don't remember who asked i think it was kimberly about managing your stories i do log my stories but when you pastor a church as long as i have here 
there are repeatable stories um, for sure. But it felt so right to use the story that I used this week in regards to um, Unwavering Faith was the title of the sermon, Pastor Steve. And I used this, this, you know, of course, the topic there is teaching about the promised son of David and the divine son of God. And so, you know, walking through that, you know, finding a story about that in your own personal life is an interesting dynamic. Did you do it? I did. I uh, decided to talk about um, a time I, a time in my life when, well, I'd already been a believer for some years, but came the moment when I knew the answer to the question. Because the question is, who is God? So the answer to the question for me is that I knew that God was really the promised son of David, really the divine son of God on the day that we lost our daughter. Oh, wow. And so I had them put a picture of the graveside up when I said, and I, and then I used your, uh, I thought it was great when you brought in the, the context of um, those that d didn't have what Paul had. Paul had a, a resurrection experience. Paul had a Damascus road experience, but most of us don't have that. And I said, you know, the young couple uh, in that, you know, story of losing their daughter, Joe and Marion, we didn't have that kind of experience, but what we had was we had the answer to the question. And that's how I preached that sermon. Wow. So um, I, I enjoyed myself um, immensely, but I was very nervous about it because, oh, you know, and so I'm just being transparent with you all. You know, I, I know I preach a lot, but it's still, yeah. So it's still, but I value giving myself to the work ethic of it, so. That was, that, that's fabulous. And that's exactly what should be happening. You took the principle out of the word, and then and then you said here and what a what a, and again you were able to hold out your scars. And say, and yet listen to what God did to us, and how He got us through that. And I I can only imagine everybody in the in the room, was moved by that. Right, and 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 because it was true, it wasn't like I was making it up, like oh, we had this, some spiritual experience. We didn't. We were just a young couple that didn't know anything except the answer to that question. Praise God. And um, so one of the things I try to do, and of course, once you all get through all of this, we will offer Cheryl's services to you about um, preaching uh, you know, persuasive speech and, and carrying your story all the way through your sermon. So this was something that I did on Sunday as I carried this story all the way through the sermon so that people could keep relating to it. So before we leave, uh, Randy Kilman has his hand up. I just had a quick comment that I wanted to make. And what I keep hearing over and over again, you know, Pastor Steve, even as you read through 2 Timothy um, 1, is in the beginning and end of that, even into, into verse six through verse seven, and I just hear Pastor Marion speaking back into it, is I think that we, we all know this, but I think it's something that we really have to receive. And I was honored enough to pray into that, not even knowing how it was gonna end tonight. And that's um, receiving the gift of inspiration. And, um, you know, even through Second Timothy, it, it wasn't, we're not to, not to be, um, I, what I wrote down was not, we're not to be inspired by fear at all, but only by that of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it, it just continues to say to me over and over again, that that's just the other gift that the, that the Spirit's trying to really engage us with is receiving that gift. You know, because we see the disciples, we see all of us and, and what you talked about tonight, um, you know, so beautifully, I just over and over kept hearing, you know, that, that, that gift of inspiration, being that character, being translucent. This pastor is a storyteller. I mean, I tell stories all day long and I love to interact myself, you know, in a good and a bad and um, engage people because the power of the word is in our testimony. And me being able to be an inspiration to somebody else through anything that I've been through or that I'm going through 
just as all the disciples, you know, that was the real power through anything that, that God gave, whether it be in a parable, but that was, that was like, to me, almost the first gift that was received in a lot of ways in the beginning and the end with the, with the disciples was a gift of inspiration. So I just wanted to add that, that that's my takeaway. <laughs> and um, so thank you. One thing I've observed is you guys are quite prophetic. And uh, Randy, you just, you just prophesied there. You just said, you took the text, God has not given us a spirit of fear, and you just said, and people, he's going to give us revelation. We don't need to be afraid. He'll reveal his word over and over again. That's what a conclusion. Thank you for that. Awesome. Um, Pastor Steve, a clarification. Did you want them to come Saturday with an outline? I, I would love it. If, if you want to begin up with an outline, I, 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 um, I was going to get, I was going to give you some assignment later, but if you can start, take this thing. Well, it, just try a text and just do those three steps and then come to me and say, that doesn't make sense at all. And, and we'll work, we'll work with that, but just give it a shot. Pick, pick anything. And just find the logical unit. Just just take those three steps. And then if you could share your experience a little bit, uh, I think that would be really, really good. Awesome. Um, let's see. Harlan, would you unmute yourself and pray in closing? Or are you with us? Yes, he's with us. I'm here and I can. Thank you. Lord, thank you for your inspiration. Thanks for touching us with stories to tell about how you have been faithful. And as we prepare this, Lord, we just uh, pray that you would give us the insight of the story that you are telling so that we can retell it well. We can tell it with personal insights and with application. Lord, so as we walk away from this day, we thank you for Steve and uh, uh, the rich blessing that he is to each one of us and the gift that he brings to this conversation. We thank you for Marion for providing this uh, resource to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to acknowledge that gift by putting ourself into the work. And so as we go away from this place, Lord, I just pray that you would in inspire us with the verse and your message and help us in the preparation. Keep us safe and well in the meantime. And uh, we thank you for being in our midst. And we ask this and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And one last question, Pastor Steve. Does the outline have to be a text from Romans or do you care where it comes from? No, you can, you, you can choose anything you like. Okay, great. Very good. Good night, okay. you guys. Good night, you guys. God bless. See you Saturday.